Hello and welcome back to the course Life of Christ. We're in the middle of class 17, talking about what Jesus means and wants for us when he discusses sexual purity. In the first part of this class, we talked about pornography and some stats associated with that and other aspects of sexuality in our culture today. And in this class, we want to look at the question, is it possible to be sexually pure? And if it is, how do you go about doing that? So today we want to go on and uh, begin by asking you to take a moment, maybe put this on pause, uh, and write down your definition of what sexual purity is. And if you're with a group, take a minute to discuss it after you get done uh, to see how your definitions compare. And as always, if you can add a scripture from the Sermon on the Mount or any other part of scripture, then do that too uh, to help you define it and understand it. Okay, so take a a few minutes to do that, then we'll come back. All right, so I hope you had a chance to do that. Uh, and if you're in a group uh, that you talked about it, to share and to learn about that. Um, some people, I believe, would define sexual purity, and maybe uh, you did this as well, as avoiding having intercourse with anyone but your spouse. And that's a pretty good definition that, that does knock out fornication, that does knock out adultery. Uh, and so it covers some important pieces of the idea of sexual purity, but in some ways may be incomplete. Uh, a second definition I've heard before is uh, being more, more pure than people around you. You think, well, that's kind of weak. And it is, and yet sometimes that's the standard. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Uh, and so uh, that's another possible definition, but not a strong one. Uh, number three is uh, being pure according to your own standards. And this sounds generally like, well, I have my standards and I try not to hurt anyone. And I believe uh, to operate certain ways and I'm true to my own standards. I have my own truth and my own practices and I'm, I'm being consistent with my own standards. And again, it's good to have it thought through, and it's good to have a certain standard that you've defined and considered, and it's good to be faithful to your standards, but the question is, what are the standards that you decided on? And it could be that they're great standards according to what Jesus says, and it could be there's quite a bit of difference between what he says and what uh, someone might do. And then uh, the fourth definition, and I think in some ways this is the most complete, uh, you probably have something like this in yours, uh, choosing to obey God's design for sex in every thought and act. And that's a lot more comprehensive. It's a lot more detailed. Every thought and act, <laughs> uh, that's really difficult, uh, and it seems unattainable. And yet that seems to be what we read in Matthew 5, 27 through 30, when he says, if you even look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. Uh, and so Jesus evidently thinks that it's possible to control every thought and act uh, after a while with discipline, with maturity, with practice, so that uh, you can attain sexual purity. So if you look at that last goal, one of the questions is, is that even possible? Uh, you look at everything around and all the landmines we mentioned in the last class, the just the prevalence of pornography and every kind of sexual practice, and you think, man, with all of that, I don't know how I can get through uh, maybe even a week and be sexually pure, much less a whole life. Um, and so if you think about it just a little bit, um, I think it's possible that, that we have looked at it and, and we thought, okay, I could do that for five minutes. For example, if you're working on a certain project, uh, if you're reading a certain passage in the Bible, if you're during doing a service opportunity for someone, uh, there are actually you know significant chunks of time every day when uh, we are sexually pure in our minds and our acts. We're not engaged in anything that would displease the Lord, and so it's possible uh, to be sexually pure for a certain amount of time. And so you say, well, you know, I think I could see uh, doing that for a whole day if I really concentrated on it and avoided landmines and controlled my thoughts and, and how I responded to the stimuli that comes in around me every day. I think I could do that for a day. And then you say, and then if I had a day of it, if I did it, then I know it's possible. So then I'd try to do a two-day streak and then maybe a three-day streak. I think I could do it for a week. 
And I, I think that's possible. I think many people have done that where their lives are so focused on what the Lord wants and, and living in good ways, being with good people, doing good things, uh, that they can achieve sexual purity for days or weeks at a time. And so then all of a sudden we realize this is possible. And then the question is, do we want to do it? Do we want to be sexually pure? Uh, it is possible, but it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of consistency. Uh, and, and it also is something that you will fail at. And then it's discouraging to try to start over again. And the temptation from Satan is to give up. You know, that's too hard. You tried it. You did good for a while. Give yourself a break. Uh, you know, come back to that next month or next year. Uh, and yet that's not what the Lord talks about for people who are followers of Jesus. And so you look at uh, being possible and then actually doing it. And I want to suggest uh, that uh, Jesus, you know, looking at him and how he operates, uh, has different ways to help us be sexually pure. Uh, some of these come out of the Gospels and some uh, come out of other parts of the New Testament or just practical, practical suggestions that are based uh, on uh, biblical ideas. And so uh, number one, in fact, here's the whole list, and we'll go through this list a little bit at a time. Number one is to seek total purity. In other words, don't have your goal be kind of good or mostly pure, right? Um, if you are thinking about uh, a marriage covenant and you're at the wedding and you're in front of the minister and you're giving and receiving vows from your spouse and they ask the question, will you be faithful to your spouse as long as you both live? And then your spouse waits uh, to answer or you wait to answer and your spouse is looking at you. What are you going to say? <laughs> you know what answer you want. You want total purity. Are you going to be faithful? You don't want to say most of the time. You don't want to say, well, probably 98 days out of every hundred because the wedding would stop right there. When you're in front of the minister, you want the answer to be yes. Totally faithful, 100% of the time. That's, that's the goal. And that's what Jesus puts out as the goal as well. Be perfect. That applies to this too. That's what Paul puts out in this passage in Ephesians 5. Let's read that beginning in verse 1. Listen to the kind of detail he mentions as Christians are confronting this and other areas. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Uh, do you notice how he gives you no room, not a hint, any kind? <laughs> uh, there's just no slack there. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. Now let me pause here for just a minute. Because I'm sure that as I read those first few verses, some people looked at, you know, their own lives and said, then it's hopeless. I've already messed up big time and I've been a Christian and and it still doesn't work. Uh, if this is the case and you say we have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God, then I'm already gone. And of course, I want to remind you that if you're a Christian, then uh, you became a Christian by the grace of God and you'll continue to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus by the grace of God. And so if you have these struggles, God will forgive you. Uh, he will give you innumerable chances to start over. But what he wants is the commitment to say, look, I'm committed to total purity. I may not make it, but every time I mess up, I'm going to try again, start over. And that's extremely discouraging and difficult to do sometimes. But it's the reality. God says, I'm with you. I'm not giving up on you. He will relentlessly help you if you don't give up. And then even if you give up, he'll try to woo you back and help you uh, begin again. Uh, so he's a, a good God, but the point is that uh, the goal is not partial, 
about total purity. Okay, going on then in verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And so again, uh, total purity uh, in your relationship with your spouse, uh, just as they want that total purity, we want it too. Going back to the example of the cockroaches, how many cockroaches do you want in your food while you're eating it? And the answer is always zero, <laughs> right? Total purity. All right. Um, so uh, number two, um, keep the mind pure. And if we look at these passages, go with me over to a shorter passage there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and listen to this, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I love that phrase, take captive every thought. And the question is, how do you take thoughts captive? <laughs> it's a difficult thing, but Paul says it's a war, uh, and you have to look at every thought and make sure that, that God is in control of that thought. Okay. And then we have the, the passage in Matthew 5 we already read about don't even look at a woman lustfully because that leads to spiritual adultery. And then if we jump over to Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, Paul says this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. And so, again, there's the mind part of it. How do you take captive every thought? Paul is saying this is how you take it captive. You have all these options of thoughts that you could have, all the good ones that are true, admirable, lovely, etc., and all the bad ones that are sinful, lustful, greedy. Uh, and Paul says you take captive your thoughts by choosing to think on the good. And, and your mind will go like a ping pong ball back and forth between the good and the bad, drawn back to the bad at first especially until you develop the habit of choosing the good and the more and more that you dwell on the good the less the bad will have an attraction okay and so that's part of taking your mind captive and then verse 9 talks about whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me put it into practice and so you not only think about it but then your pure thoughts become pure actions and that reinforces your pure thoughts okay and then Romans 12, 2 here talks about uh, being transformed by the renewing of your minds. Okay, so again, the, the battle starts in the mind uh, and can be largely won uh, if the mind is set right. Okay, uh, number three, don't consume trash. Uh, this has to do with where you go in towns or neighborhoods. It has to do with what you look at on TV. Uh, what you rent on Netflix or watch on Netflix or Hulu or, or Amazon Prime or whatever. Um, uh, it has to do with who you talk to and the topics of your conversation. It has to do, of course, with where you surf on the Internet. All of those things together, in general, all the things that we use for entertainment in our off times, uh, that's one of the times when instead of relaxing and, and being mindless, we need to be most vigilant, most on guard, because that's the time when Satan will try to sneak in all these thoughts and ideas and convince us it's not that big a deal. It, it doesn't bug me. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm an adult, so I can handle this. Um, that's not actually true uh, for most people. Uh, so it makes a difference um, uh, whether or not we consume trash. 
because we put trash in, that's what's going to be in our minds. Um, I knew one guy that became a Christian and he had had problems with uh, prostitution and pornography before as a Christian. And he was a salesman and he would go around certain neighborhoods in the downtown area of his city. Uh, and he knew that certain parts of those neighborhoods were where the adult stores were and where prostitutes would solicit work. And uh, so he said after he became a Christian, he would actually go blocks out of his way to avoid walking down those streets and avoid the temptation, right? Uh, you know, you could say, well, but he needs to go back and try to convert some of those people to Jesus. And that's a good point. Uh, someone needs to do that. But probably the person that needs to do that is not the person who is coming out of temptation and struggling with that. That can be done by someone else that has already conquered that or doesn't struggle with it as much. And I admire this man because he had made his life more difficult, <laughs> a lot more walking, uh, but it helped him avoid some temptations. Uh, number four here, uh, uh, let's see here, be honest. Uh, when I hear, for example, uh, parents, especially guys, saying, well, I can watch this R-rated movie with sex and with violence and profanity in it, uh, and, and it doesn't really affect me because I'm an adult, and yet their seven-year-old son sits with them, and they turn it off, or they send the seven-year-old out of the room, and the seven-year-old says, well, Dad, but, but you're watching it. Uh, and the dad says, yeah, but, but I'm an adult. I know how to handle it. And I would say that that person perhaps is not being honest, uh, that it will affect us in some way. It may not affect us to the same extent as far as uh, we understand things that the child might not understand. We have a, a different context for it. But to say it doesn't affect us at all, I think we're not being totally honest with ourselves. And then number five, uh, be consistent. Uh, don't say that you can do it, but your child can't or your friend can't, because I guarantee you, uh, when it comes down to what your child imitates, your words or your actions, he's going to imitate your actions, he or she. Uh, and so the more consistent that you can be and say, well, you know, if I tell you you shouldn't do it, then I'm not going to do it either. And you can even say to the child, hey, this is a struggle for me too. And so how about if you and me work on it together and together we'll help each other out? That's powerful. Uh, for a child uh, when they can be partners in doing something good with a parent. Uh, number six, uh, be responsible for yourself in every way. Responsible for yourself in every way. In other words, it's not uh, other people's responsibility to keep you uh, pure. Uh, they can help you at times, but it's not their fault if you mess up. And if you commit a certain sin, a sexual aggression, for example, it's not somebody else's fault. It's your fault. And if somebody else around you dresses a certain way, that doesn't matter in the sense that it's still your responsibility to take care of your thoughts and your mind. If you need to walk out or walk away, it's choose other things to think about, choose other people to be with, then do that. You're responsible. Uh, you can't blame other people for what you think or what you do. Uh, they're responsible for how they act and how they think and how they dress but you're responsible for you. Um, number uh, seven, uh, pray for other people. Um, and this is something that uh, at first seemed kind of humorous. Somebody said one time, it's impossible uh, to uh, lust after a woman and pray for her at the same time. And it sounds kind of humorous at first. And yet I've actually tried that, you know, when I see a woman uh, there and, and she catches my attention in some way, uh, if I'm tempted to think bad thoughts about her, uh, I've tried to pray that, for example, if she is married, that she can be faithful to her husband, that if she's not married yet, she can be uh, pure until she's married. Uh, the whole idea is that you're, you're thinking about different things in relation to that woman when you begin to pray for her, and the same for women praying for guides, etc. cetera. Um, and also uh, pray for uh, their faithfulness to the Lord that they can come to know the Lord and, and be faithful to him in every way. Uh, praying is powerful because you really can't pray and lust at the same time. Um, also, number eight, remember that every person uh, is a son or daughter of someone. Uh, I have a son and I have a daughter. Uh, and I don't want anyone else thinking uh, thoughts about them. And I don't want anyone else trying to cause them to stumble. Uh, and so if I remember 
that everybody that I see on the street or everybody I see online is a son or daughter of someone that helps me be more disciplined and want the right things for them, just like I want for my kids. Um, number nine, uh, find someone you trust, a friend, to help keep you accountable. Uh, and this is difficult in some ways, and then after you've done it for a while, you realize it's, it's really good. Uh, this is uh, someone that you trust a lot that won't go talking about you or, or this problem. And you tell them, look, I want your help in this to keep me accountable. Uh, I want to do good things. I don't want to be faithful to the Lord and to my wife and my family. Uh, and so every week, let's get together and let's talk about uh, how it's going for us. And so, for example, when we lived in a different town, I had a neighbor who was a Christian. And we'd get together every week uh, early in the morning, one morning to, to play racquetball. Uh, and then after we played racquetball, then we would talk about how the week had gone. And we'd ask each other several questions. One of them was, uh, how is your thought life this week? In other words, you're thinking about people online, you know, what you're watching in movies or videos. How is your thought life this week? Uh, second, how did you treat your wife this week? Uh, you know, did you respect her? Did you honor her? Did you set a good example for her and your kids? How did you treat your wife and family this week? And the third, sometimes we would ask was, did you just tell me the truth in this? <laughs> uh, and those are great questions. And I'll tell you that knowing that somebody else is praying for you and seeking the best for you and that they will ask you these questions every week, that makes it easier to avoid temptations, even if it's just because you don't want to admit that you fell down that week. <laughs> and so that's an important strategy uh, to help uh, keep yourself and others accountable. And then number 10, I think I said nine, but actually there's there's 10 in the list. Um, consider the consequences of what you might do and what it could happen to your family or you, uh, how it affects your future marriage or your current marriage. Um, if you get caught in a certain sin, uh, what will you tell your kids? Uh, and I, I knew about a number of people that have had affairs, that have had problems, pornography, all kinds of problems. Uh, and one of the strongest motivations that I found talking to people is they hate to think about disappointing their kids. The idea of telling their kids to do something and then they have to come back and say, I got caught in this sin I told you not to do. It's shameful. It's embarrassing. It's painful. And, and they would have done anything. Uh, to go back and change that. Uh, think about uh, possible pregnancies and how that can affect careers and futures. Think about uh, the impact on your influence with other people, especially depending on if you're a minister and many ministers fall into sexual sin. Uh, if you're a minister, uh, that's just deadly. Uh, it's one of the things that can kill your influence quicker than anything else in ministry. And if you're a Christian, it's one of the things that can kill your influence with non-Christians because they say, look, you're a Christian and you're doing this and I haven't done that and I'm not a Christian. Uh, so how is being a Christian any help to you in this? It can damage your influence. And then, of course, there are possible physical illnesses or diseases that you can get. In some ways, though, they're not unimportant. They're the least important of all these possible consequences. Uh, and so as you consider what you're watching, what you're going to do, how you're going to act, how it's going to affect your marriage. Uh, the consequences are huge, and sometimes they can help prevent making decisions that would be disastrous and very damaging to you in your life. Now, there's a number of resources uh, that you can look at. There, These are several that help you, for example, put filters on your computers at home, uh, books that help you give uh, get practical ways to combat these things, movies that you can watch, uh, places where you can learn more about stats and have different tactics in different areas of your life uh, so that you can respond to all the temptations connected to sexual temptations there. Um, some final thoughts about it. Um, I would say that it is 100% unlikely that anyone watching this video has not struggled with this topic in some way at some time. In fact, it's 100% likely that we have all struggled with it in a number of ways uh, for maybe for years. And so the question is not if we have fallen in sin. The question is, how are we dealing with our failures in this area?
have we decided that we're done with that and we want to do our best to be totally pure, uh, even if we haven't made it, uh, or are, have we given up and said, I don't care, it's not important, or, or I can't do it. Uh, that's just to, to give up. Uh, but remember, like we said before, uh, even if we've fallen down even hundreds of times, there's forgiveness for all that. And Jesus, remember, says, be perfect. And as you uh, also translate it the other way, you will be perfect if you stay with him. And so Jesus promises to be with you to help you overcome that kind of temptation. There's a quote that I really like here that says, I've never met a man who regretted keeping his virginity until he got married. And you could put in anything there, being pure, being faithful to his wife. I've never met a man who regretted that. But I've known hundreds of men who fell into sexual sin and regretted it forever after. Now, I think that's the bottom line. We know deep in our hearts that we want to be pure. We want to be good examples, have good influence, uh, and we'll never regret the good, but we will regret the things that are bad and how we damaged ourselves and other people. So the challenge for us with this is just to say, even if it's the hundredth time or the thousandth time, say, okay, I'm going to do my best, and Lord, I need your help, and God will give that to us. Hope this has been helpful to you, and we'll see you next time. Take care.